we'd done this podcast 10 days ago, I would have been very confident in the fact that I was beyond risk of injury now. I was <laughs> really conditioned, but actually I'm now injured again. So there's still risk that something will go wrong. And at the moment, it's just this tightness that won't go away. Sean Conway is currently in the middle of an incredible feat. He's attempting to break the record for the most consecutive full distance triathlons. Now, how long is that? That's a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, finishing off with a full marathon. And that is just one day. Sean's attempting to do that every day for 102 days in a row, which would be one more than the official record of 101. There's 10 pillars of endurance planning, fitness, food, water, sleep, muscle management, motivation, health, community, and experience. And you've got to nail all of those, really. Sean's in the middle of this challenge, and I went to visit him on day 69 to run the full marathon with him. The first three weeks were horrendous. It was so cold, wet, rainy, windy. Two days ago, someone uh, came off the bike in front of me and I went over his wheel and yeah, that could have ended it for me because that could have been a broken collarbone or something. We recorded this conversation outside whilst running. And even though Sean is in the middle of one of the most physically and mentally challenging feats that anyone can take on, he was remarkably positive and in good spirits. Thank you so much for listening. This is episode six of Great British Adventures. First of all, I have to ask, how are you? This week's been annoying. Like day 40 to 60 was awesome. I felt super strong and no niggles, but then I've picked up some niggle <coughs> in my leg, which is <coughs> actually because of the stupid cough. I've had this like hay fever cough for three weeks and I'm getting it really bad at night and I'm tensing. <laughs> And it's caused my back to seize up, which is then playing havoc on my hip and my quad. So I'm trying to stretch it, but it just keeps <coughs> seizing up again, which is annoying. Is this affecting you on the ho- throughout the whole day, swim and bike as well? I wake up and it's there. I know it's there. The swim, I'm fine. Like the swim sort of fixes stuff. On the bike, I don't feel it, but it's where it gets tighter because I'm, I'm bent over and um, it's sort of getting worse on the bike and then when I start the run it's (coughs) excuse me just really painful (laughs) the cough is sounding really bad as well I know that's what you've been having for for quite some time is there any remedy for that oh I don't know I've tried to take hay fever tablets and that's sort of working (coughs) I'm coughing all day but I don't feel bad It just keeps me up at night. That's the only annoying thing. (laughs) You're sounding remarkably strong. You're looking remarkably strong, considering this is day 69 of 102. Just take me through your day today. What's a day in the life of Sean Conway look like? What time do you wake up? I've actually got a pretty specific routine now that I've took me about a month to work it out, but I get up at 4.29, but actually I'm waking up a little bit before my alarm now. Uh, Justin, who does my social media, is a long, long time friend. I've known him since I was 10 years old. He's staying with us and he puts my porridge in the microwave at about 20 past. And I hear the ping because uh, I'm in the spare room, which is next to the, the kitchen. So, yeah, so I sort of wake up about 20 past, but I wait for my alarm. And while I'm in bed, I do a bit of stretching. Well, what does that feel like when your alarm goes off? Because you must be in all kinds of pain. Yeah. And is it a struggle to get out of bed, to get yourself out? Not really, to be honest. It's a non-negotiable, you know? It's like, do you brush your teeth every day? Yeah, it's, you don't question it, right? It's just something that you do every day. So for me to get up and go to the pool, it's like, it's non-negotiable. So yeah, it's everything hurts. Um, and the first few weeks, it was difficult to actually just physically stand up. Uh, mainly my ankles really, but they've strengthened a little bit now. So that's not too bad. It's my hip and back at the moment. That's quite sore in the morning. Just what time are you starting your swim? <clears throat> Originally I was getting up at three at 4.34, but I found I was getting in the pool at like one or two minutes past five. And that would annoy me. And I thought, right, well, I need to get in before five. Cause then I felt like I've won the day already. So I moved my alarm to 429. That's why that 29, that, that 29 is specific, right? Because you could have had yeah. 430. 
Yeah, well, no, I can't do alarms on the obvious number. Uh, just can't, never. Why's that? Don't know. Just can't do it. <laughs> There's something in my brain that just says, I don't know. Yeah, never done it. I've never had an alarm. I guess if it's specific, it means something. It's yeah. important. Yeah, I don't know. I've just always done it. I've never had an alarm on like the obvious hour or whatever. But also the 34 was meant I was late getting in the pool by a couple of minutes. So I just brought it forward. And now I'm early getting in the pool. Today I was in at seven minutes, eight minutes to five, you know, and then I feel like I, I've won the day, even though in the grand scheme of things, I'm doing a 14 hour, 13 and a half, 14 hour full distance. Eight minutes is not going to change my world, but psychologically, it's quite important, really. Well, it's these small things that you can implement, which if they're in place day after day, they're going to have a lasting effect, right? Yeah, especially early on when I was hustling for minutes in the early days, it was super important because, you know, on day two, I, I nearly didn't make the 17 hour cutoff. Is that a crucial element, this challenge is doing it within the 17 hours? So it's not an official rule. Really, you've actually got midnight to midnight. So if you do a decker or a double decker, uh, one a day, then you've you've just got, you know, you've got to get to the swim at 6 a.m. or whatever it is. So you've got the full 24 hours, but you've got to get sleep in there. But uh, the 17 hour thing is sort of what James Lawrence did. And it's sort of what the internet expects um, because that's the, what an Ironman cutoff is. Uh, and also it's not sustainable doing it anywhere near 17 hours anyway, truthfully, <laughs> because if you're taking 17 hours, you're probably, well, you're not getting nearly enough sleep. So you would just get slower and slower if you were anywhere near the 17 hours. There must be a balance between finishing this as soon as possible to maximize your rest, yeah. but not finishing it too quick that you're going to jeopardize your body the next day going forward. Exactly. And it all depends on personal fitness. The fast people who do double deckers will do them in 12 hours a day. And then they've got 12 hours rest, but they're still doing it in zone two. So they're super fit, right? I'm not quite there. I'm pretty good though. I'm doing it on a good day, a 13 and a half. Um, and I'm in zone one pretty much with heart rate, average heart rate, 110. You know, right now we're running along and I'm 109 heart rate and uh you know i'm not going fast by any means <laughs> but that's the goal if you can stay in sort of zone one early zone two for heart rate and still get eight hours sleep then this becomes sort of a lot easier just a recovery point of view from a performance point of view and i think 14 hours for me gives me that i've got a half hour drive to get home which is annoying you know so I needed to be half an hour quicker than anyone else doing this where they finish the run at their house, for example. This is something you tried to do last year, was it? Were you finishing at home last year? Yeah, I wanted to sort of limit my disruption to the family. And also, again, yeah, just get as much sleep as possible. But I just where I live is too hilly. So I had to come down here half an hour away to do the run. I mean, there's lots of mistakes I made last year. <laughs> you know, my route wasn't great. My fitness wasn't as good as it should have been. It probably wouldn't have been sustainable going forward, do you think? Um, so also last year, I didn't realize the 17 hour thing is what people wanted because I just thought I could do it in 24 hours. So initially I thought, well, I'll do super slow at the beginning and then just build into it. And uh, I may have, because I think naturally I would have I'd already started implement changes last year. Like I'd already decided to move to a pool. So I'd done a couple of days in the pool already. I would have probably changed the route again, which is what I did on this one. You know, after a couple of weeks, I realized some of the roads were getting really bad with potholes and especially with the group of people as the numbers started to pick up with people joining me, I realized the route was bad. So I just found it, you know, found a new route. And uh, so I think I would have done that on the last attempt, but yeah, coming off the bike, just sort of put a nail in the coffin on that really. So 5 a.m., you're starting your swim. 
Well, I've seen many videos of you in the past few weeks walking into the swimming pool, the Mold Leisure Centre, almost limping in your pajamas. Is it a blessing that you start something that takes a lot of body weight off you at the beginning of the day to get you warmed into the day going forward? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, multiple triathlons in whatever distance <laughs> would be very different if the run was first. <laughs> because, I don't know, I, I've, there's no way, if you said, Sean, get up at 4.30 and go and run a marathon. Oh, just no way. It's just not possible. Hello, mate. Um, yeah, it just wouldn't happen. And when you slide into the pool and you begin your the first few strokes, what's the mindset going through those first few laps, knowing you've got a whole day ahead of you? Um, <coughs> the swim fixes everything. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, the swim fixes everything. You know, as you say, it's it's the one that least can go wrong. The difference between an amazing day and a terrible day is, you know, f f 10 minutes maximum. So, and I quite like it. So I just get into my groove, I listen to music and I just swim. And then in the early days, you know, towards the end of the swim, I'd get quite stressed because I didn't know if any riders would be outside jo to join me. And, uh, you know, that was weighing on my mind because part of this challenge is trying to, you know, encourage a whole group of really strong riders to sort of support me and pull me around the course. And I didn't know whether that would happen or not. But luckily, it, uh, I've been blown away, really, by the support from some, like, phenomenal riders. Seems like it's definitely helped you get into the group because... Um, obviously it helps with air resistance, so it's a bit less power in your legs, but also you've just got a distraction. You've got someone just kind of just look ahead the road for you, hazard spot, lots of things like that, which when you're doing something like this every day, your mind is going to be slipping, right? It's not going to be as sharp as, as a fresh rider with fresh legs. Yeah, there's pros, pros and cons uh, to have a group riding with you. You know, two days ago, someone uh, came off the bike in front of me and I went over his wheel and yeah that could have ended it for me because that could have been a broken collarbone or something but you need them because you know the, if you did the solo on your own which I think someone will do one day yeah gee I mean you'd you, you probably be an hour slower every day on bad weather days I, w I would say or you're pushing 30% more power you know on the times I've been on my own, just to sort of do a sustainable day, I've done, what, 140 watts average? Uh, when I'm with the group, I'm doing 100 watts. So, yeah, you really do rely on them, but it is quite, it actually takes a lot of sort of mental brain space to follow someone else's wheel 10 centimeters behind them. You know, because you gotta, you can't see the pothole when you've got five riders in front of you. So you're relying on them, pointing them out. I mean, luckily I know every pothole backwards now. <coughs> I might even start naming them. You could get a job at the council, <coughs> I'm sure. Yeah, it is sometimes stressful. Like today we had a, quite a big group early on. It's Saturday and a couple of people were sort of new to the peloton and weren't that experienced and would miss a few potholes. But you, I need them, you know, I need people to come out and support and pull me around the course and they have and it's been incredible you know I've created a there's been a little community that's been created um, around the challenge and and people are using it to actually get some fast training in because if you wanted to go out if you're a cyclist and you wanted to go and do a six hour ride and do 112 miles you know it'd be pretty hard you'd have to get find a couple of your strong mates we were all up for it at the same time. You could probably only do it on a weekend. And that's it, you can do it maybe on Saturday. Whereas these riders know that any day of the week, they can pop out, jump in with me and whoever else has decided to join me and smash out a hundred miles in six hours. And they're using that to their advantage for training for Ironman Wales, Ironman Hamburg that's just been, uh, and their own challenges. So. It's actually awesome to watch, like 69 days in, all the riders that have been with me from day one, 
are so fast now. You know, I can hardly keep up with them. <laughs> it's been remarkable seeing it actually. And like you said, it is always better when you can train together. One thing that's um, out of your control has been the weather, which you mentioned earlier. It seems from, a, from an observer that you've been fairly lucky. You haven't had too many extremes, except for the last week when it's been particularly hot. Yeah, well, the first three weeks were horrendous. It was so cold, wet, rainy, windy. You know, to do, <coughs> you know, doing a seven hour bike course felt fast because of the wind and the rain. And it, cover, it covers up all the potholes, you know, when it rains. And so it was super slow. <coughs> 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 And then I've been lucky last, over a month at least, we've had no rain. But for the last two weeks, it's been so hot. You know, just too hot really. Yeah, I think today is the first day when it's cooled down a lot. Yeah, this is the first non-sunny day, it's a bit overcast. I'm and running into wind now, which is a bit slower, but it uh, at least keep cool really. So uh, I've probably been, a, a bit luckier than I had planned on the weather, but I deserved it after those first few weeks, I think. <laughs> what are you eating every day? You yeah. said you had porridge in the morning. Yeah. Talk yeah, us through yeah. your food. Uh, milks, meats, nuts, fruit. I have... Yeah, you get some nutrition lines. now. Yeah, here we go. Vicky's just arrived on her bike yeah. with, uh, with the bottle. What's in the bottle, Vicky? Um, electrolytes. So we have two of those on the run. So two 700 mil bottles. Is there any oh, fuel? Any food for the run? Yeah, there is. Yeah. So uh, we've got one cook. We've got one cooked meal per lap, one ready meal. Uh, bananas, nuts, um, cereal bars, fresh fruit, milkshakes, whatever Sean fancies. Just mix it up. So we're doing the run. We're doing uh, a half marathon lap, and then we go back to the base, the gym, where I guess that gives you the best chance to. To get some proper food down to you, down down you get um, go to the toilet, stretch, foam roll, whatever it takes to get back out again. And then we're doing the same loop again. Yeah, I mainly use it just to go to the loo. I don't really stop much. Go to the loo and then just straight out again. I eat throughout the run, um, just a little and often really. <laughs> That's the plan. I have to ask. I know there's many maybe reasons for this this question, but why are you doing this? Well, I thought of it 20, in 2018. So when James Lawrence had done the 50 and 50 states in America, I was just super captivated by that. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. And then, I don't know, I just thought, mate, I wonder if I could do 100. I even thought of a route. So I lived in the lakes. Uh, the route would have been terrible in hindsight, but at the time I thought I could swim in Coniston cycle down towards Olverston and Barrow, it's a bit flatter, back to Coniston, uh, and then run up and down the quiet side twice, and that's a marathon. And then, yeah, just life got in the way, really. Other stuff came up, so it didn't happen. And then James went on and did 101, which was inspiring. And I thought, right, well, let me see if I can have another crack at it. Because it was it's an obvious progression for me from all the other stuff, you know. I'm still the only person in history to have done a Land's End to John O'Groats triathlon. And I used to have the record for the longest ever triathlon in continuous form. So even without James, I probably would have stumbled across this on my own. But maybe, would I have done 100? Don't know, hard to tell really. Probably not. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great benchmark to put out there for yeah. everyone else to try. Yeah. What this differs to your other challenges is that your cycle across Land's End, John O'Groats, and your and your run and your swim you didn't have to do it every single day. Yeah. If you if something came up where you had to rest for a day or some emergency, that wouldn't have affected the end result, which is getting to the end under your own steam. Yeah. This is different. This is every day. This is 102 yeah, days. Yeah. In things like these, there's two types of records. There's actual and average. So for people who have this, for example the, you know, how many marathons have you run in a year? You can have the, he, he averaged, a, you know, a, a marathon a year, which meant he did some short days and some long days, or you'd actually did a marathon a day. 
So this one is the actual one. There's no averaging. Um, so yeah, you're right. You just there's no rest days. Let's say I was super slow one day, and you know midnight came, and I was a mile short. That's it. It's over. I can't make up that mile tomorrow, and then carry on with the challenge. Or you know I can't do a double on a day. Not that I would <laughs> or could. And then the, the next you know, have a rest day after that, yeah. So you've got to do an actual full every single day, no rest days. Which is not just a challenge for the body, it's a challenge on the mind, no, no. which I think this is what, you've talked about your experience with running, swimming and cycling, and it seems like you have that, that stamina within you, which, and I suppose your mind has kind of come into those challenges at the same time, but this is really challenging the mind when you have to get up every single day and go out and do this. Um, yeah, but it's nothing I've not done before, you know, even at 102 days, this will still be the third longest thing I've done. So I have got up every day and been cold and miserable and wet quite often. So that bit actually didn't, doesn't scare me. The 100 actually didn't scare me at all. The thing that did scare me was when I, in April, people said you're going to be doing this until July, end of July nearly. That was like, oh God, that's, I didn't, that bit sounded like forever. But when you said, if someone said, oh, you'd do a hundred, I don't know, it didn't, that one didn't scare me because I've done longer stuff and I've, I've been miserable a lot in life <laughs> doing things. So, um, but yeah, it is, it is relentless. This one, there's no pause button. It's great that you've got a, good, a team around you looking after all the little things. I saw Vicky arrive half an hour before you came into uh, the T2 transition, lay out all your gear, there's a chair ready for you, your shoes and socks are out ready, there's Vaseline, there's food, there's foam rollers, yeah. everything you needed so that you could get swiftly off the bike, have the little rest you needed in the transition and then get back on the run. Your team must be an incredible asset to you. Yeah, oh God, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it'd be very hard to do this without a good team you know this people do you'd have to have a really small route for example on, on the bike and the run so if you had a mechanical you could get back to your own base and stuff but really you're just throwing in a lot of risk factors and as you say you know there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on you know right now with the morning crew they're getting food ready for tomorrow all the bottles ready vicky was doing that last night and prep for today so trying to get me home as soon as possible so that I can get as much sleep as possible which is you know one of the priorities really you're also doing this to raise money for a charity true venture yeah tell me about why you've chosen to support true venture so Ryan who started it you know he was telling me about some of the figures of uh, child participation youth participation in sports in Wales and it's terrible. You know, <coughs> COVID has a lot to <coughs> blame for that. But 66,000 fewer kids in Wales do sport outside of school since COVID. Only 39% of kids uh, do sport outside of school. And sport, is, you know, I'd, everyone knows how important is sport for community, health, well-being, mental health and everything. So... Our goal is just to be able to provide facilities and and clubs and communities to you know get kids into sport and then make them love sport and then stay in sport. I'll let you go first. So Thank you. yeah, I might have some of my meal now. So Sean's just grabbing some food. Let me chat with some other people that are here. Hi, what's your name? Bronwyn. Bronwyn, where have you come from today? Uh, today I've come from Oswestry. Uh, which is where my family are based, but normally I live in Oxford. And why did you come up? Uh, so I'm here because my partner Alex <laughs> has been following Sean for a while. Um, I actually only heard, like, learned about who he was a couple of weeks ago, but it seems like a really cool thing to be doing, so I thought I would join as well. And you're on your bike, which definitely seems like the best form of transport for this. <laughs> yes, uh, it definitely is. Um, I do run, but not marathons and also not half marathons. Uh, so I thought a bike would be more suitable. What has it been like 
watching Sean for the past hour or two. Yeah, I mean, wild to see how he's sort of just grinding through it, but also seems very calm and relaxed. Hi, Alex. Yeah, hey, how's it going? Good. You've come and joined Sean with the run today. You're going to do one lap, which is the half marathon. Yeah, I've been keeping an eye on Sean's progress over Instagram recently and thought it'd be really cool to just come along for a bit, support, see how he's doing. What made you want to come? The whole idea of what he's doing completely blows my mind. Like, I'm a triathlete myself, hoping to do an Ironman one day. And if I do that, if I reach that one day, that'll be a huge achievement, like <laughs> achievement of a lifetime for me. So just the idea of what someone like Sean can do day in, day out, it's absolutely crazy. So yeah, just had to see it for myself, I guess. And seeing this all in action now, what are your thoughts? What do you think you've been able to see and experience? It's really cool just seeing like how people come out and support every day. Like he's clearly got a whole team of people helping him out, but also just seeing how steady and like calm he seems like it's all just routine for him now, which is really crazy impressive to see. I was wondering if what I've been seeing over the last two months is just the good bits on Instagram, but to be fair, he looks looks strong as hell. I've no doubt he's gonna finish. It's been great having you here, Alex, anyway. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Right, I'll grab Sean in a sec and finish with him. Let me just chat with his wife, Caroline, first. <laughs> um, I suppose I wanna ask you how your husband is doing. <laughs> How's Sean doing? He's doing amazing. He just, this is nine to five, a little bit different nine to five than the average person. But uh, he's never, I think he shares his low days with everybody on his socials. But when he comes home, he's still there for the boys, you know, having a good chat with them. Like he was playing football with little Sebastian in the garden the other night when he came home. So overall, he's very positive. Very focused. You're out with him today and you've been out with him on a few of the runs. How has that been? Has that been just because you've been able to get a bit of time with him during the day? <laughs> well, I've ran with him every week since he started the challenge. Um, so I started off running the halves and then about three weeks ago, um, I upped it to do the marathon. So this is my fourth marathon with him, like fourth week of, of doing the marathon. Um, and it's. I think it's nice, it gives him a little bit of a boost. It's our date run. <laughs> so it's a nice opportunity to catch up on life because we don't get a moment to really speak to each other or see each other <laughs> um, at the moment. But it is lovely with this adventure that he, he is home every night, which, you know, he could be in Timbuktu, you know. So it is quite nice. We do get a glimpse of him each evening. But uh, yeah, I'm enjoying the runs and obviously solo parenting out there at the moment. So. Um, it's a nice opportunity when the childcare aligns, thanks mum and dad, um, but uh, I get to do some exercise as well for me. It's been great to see the support that Sean's been getting from the local community, people we pass. Well done, guys. Well done, guys. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> it must be incredible for you to see that as well. Yeah, it's so lovely. It's, so, it's absolutely amazing the amount of support that he's had. Also, the people, yeah, the people which come out and the people that he's inspiring. So you don't have to go off and run a marathon. Even isn't just inspiring people to come out and run 5K with him, which is all relative to people's you know, ability and their own little mini challenge, you know? So 5K is amazing if that's what you're, you set out to do. And, you know, he's inspiring people. You know, I've got a friend up in the lakes. She swam 51 lengths because it was this 51 halfway point, you know? So it's, it's all relative your challenge. And it's so lovely that he's inspiring so many people. Your children, what are the names of him? Yeah, so Monty's our oldest boy. He's going to be four in a couple of weeks. And our youngest is 19 months and he's called Sebastian. So Monty is obviously seeing this and actually forming like real genuine memories of his dad going out, doing something crazy. Yeah. How has that experience been through his eyes? Oh, well, he knows he's doing, daddy's doing a challenge. And what's really helping is that his school, absolutely lovely. They've really got on board with Sean's challenge. So each week in assembly, Sean sends a little video message in. So he talks about what he's been doing and the kids can um, ask him questions so he answers them on video. And that really helps Monty understand, oh, that's my daddy's job. Daddy swims, cycles and runs, that's his job. So um, he understands and he always says, go daddy, go. So um, 
yeah, he, he does, he's only coming up to four and he does various different sports. He does swimming and he has a sport class and uh, he does football as well. But at this age, it's just about being active and having fun. And it's lovely to see that his daddy's active and also his mummy's active. I think that's very important in our household. We definitely don't sit around. Why do you think that is so important for the parents to set this example like this? I think it just shows them that when you have a busy lifestyle and you can still fit in time to exercise, even if it isn't your nine to five job, you know. I think it's important to, to encourage sport and it's good for their mental health, you know. It gets them outside, you know, just enjoying the outdoors and they don't have to be. I mean, he can do whatever sport he wants to do. It doesn't even have to be a sport, you know, it's, it could be hiking mountains, it could be, you know, it could be just walking. It doesn't matter whatever it is. I think as long as they're outside and enjoying nature, I think that's when we know we've done our job right as parents. Um, more to life than computers and TVs. Yeah, we're on day 69 today yeah. of 102. What toll has this taken on, on your life? <laughs> well, I have to say, I'm, I'm not the only parent out there who's solo parenting but they do say it takes a village to, to, to raise a child, don't they? And, you know, there's reasons that you don't really want to say they're parent. I mean, it is tough, but as I said, I'm not out on there, out there on my own doing it. You know, there's parents everywhere doing it, but it is hard because um, you just got a lot of plates spinning. You know, I, uh, I've got my own business and I do too got some freelance marketing clients as well, which I do. And um, our youngest isn't in nursery, so full-time mummy. And, uh, and then you're just running a house, you know, you've got to cook and clean and do everyone's laundry and life and make sure the kids have a social life. But as I said, it's obviously we're there for Sean and it's, uh, it's what parents do, isn't it? It's everyone juggles everything. And, uh, but yeah, I think uh, we're looking forward to daddy finishing and having some family time, but at the same time, it's, we're so proud of what he's doing and 100% supportive. And like you said, if he does want to continue, he can do 150 or 200 if he did feel the need. We're right there behind him, supporting him. Is that, it, is that on the cards right now? <laughs> I mean, because first of all, 102 is his first target. That's fundamentally what his mindset has to be on because so much can go wrong between now and then yeah. that could derail this. Yeah. But is that, was that a conversation from the start to see what would happen going forward? Um, it was always a conversation. I think that's quite unlikely that he would do it. Not that he's yeah. not got the ability mindset. I think it's more down to crew yeah. and their availability, if I'm being honest with you, and also sponsorship. So I don't think it's likely, but never say never. <laughs> Who knows? Sean's always full of surprises. And whatever he chooses, we support him as a family unit. So it doesn't matter, we're there for him. It's incredible that you've come back from pregnancy from two children and you're able to take part in the challenge with Sean and run the half marathon and the marathon distance regularly on a, on a weekly basis. I know, I know. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, our youngest is 19 months. So I started running. Um, I did start running and cycling gradually, but um, a friend in the village, actually, we were running together very um from christmas and we just upped it we did a 10k race a couple of months ago and then just kind of kept upping our mileage and then for sean starting this we just upped it to the half and as i said i get to go out once a week and it's probably not the best thing to do but i only run once a week i don't do any other exercise other than doing this with sean at the moment just because i'm got the kiddies um so yeah so it's probably not advisable so run a, so i'm doing a half each week and then nothing in between and then and then now I'm doing a marathon each week and nothing in between. So whether that's a sensible thing, but um, <laughs> I'm just doing it and cracking on. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I suppose before kids though, I, you know, I cycled, you know, road cycles and mountain bikes and open water swimming and running. Not good at any of them, but I enjoy it, you know. So um, um, I guess there's a base level of fitness somewhere. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's amazing how your body can bounce back after giving birth to two little little, little ones. Yeah, it's great to see. Yeah, there may be more to come, who knows? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. There's still many more days left. Yeah, well, I was talking babies rather than running. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, well, we're on that subject. <laughs>
Let's get to 102 first, yeah, eh? Let's get to 102 first. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> okay, Sean. Just a couple more things. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. No, oh, thank you for making the effort to come all the way here. Uh, you talked about how so much of what you've done in the past has built you up to do this. And thinking about it, it definitely feels like you are the type of person you can do this challenge, but not many people can. Yeah. This is not something that someone could just do with a few months of training. No, God, You've been at this no, for years. Yeah. You know, there's 10 pillars of endurance. There's planning, fitness, food, water, sleep, muscle management, motivation, uh, health, community, and experience. And you've got to nail all of those, really, if you want to kind of do well in ultra, like super long distance stuff. And yeah, no, the experience one is super important. And as you say, yeah, I mean, I mean, I have, where are we now? What, what year is it? Where are we? Are we 2023? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I have terrible memory at the minute. Um, yeah, I've got 10, 12 years experience doing long, hard things, um, which is a, probably what you need, I would say. Uh, to deal with various niggles and you know how to manage the things that pop up and you've experienced things in the past that you know if you let if you ignore them they're gonna you know dnf you so yeah i've uh i yeah i've ticked that box for this but i still think there's a few people out there who could do it if someone has always wanted to do an iron distance triathlon before, do you recommend they just go out and do one like you're doing right now? Depends on the time cutoff. <laughs> if you gave yourself three hours to do the swim and 10 hours to do the bike and eight hours to walk the marathon, maybe you could get away with it. It's just the risk of injury is so high on these just because of the time spent on your legs. Yeah, I mean, triathlon is a very popular sport. And the full distance is very popular and the Ironman official races are very popular. So more and more and more people are doing them. But if you want to do the 17 hour cutoff or a little bit quicker, you really want to invest, I would say a minimum of six months training, I would say, just to get your body conditioned so that you don't get injured really. And you're learning the fueling and and pacing and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I think you could, there's quite a lot of people who could do a really, really slow one as long as they've done some training, but it's no, you know, it's, it's, it's a long way. <laughs> How have you managed all the niggles that you've, you've built up over these 69 days? What has been your process to get through them so that they don't cause injury? My first process is panic and call my physio, Simon. <laughs> and tell him that it's all over because my knees are blown and there's no way I can carry on. He tells me to calm down and stop whining. And then he comes and uh, can we work together through, through him. I mean, there's a couple of niggles that I've, <coughs> I've always had <coughs> and I know how to manage those. You know, when my knee gets tight, I loosen, put a tennis ball in my hip and all that. Uh, excuse me. But... Yeah, without Simon, my physio, things would have looked a lot different because I did both my knees in the first couple of days. Then my front <coughs> right shin, and there was sort of concern that that pain could have been a stress fracture. Uh, it wasn't, luckily, it was just muscular. Um, a little tendon, actually. So we taped that and just I wore a brace for a week and that reduced that mobility. Um, then a couple of shoulder issues, not, not too bad, just tightness really. So for the first month I had physio, well, first two weeks I had physio once a day uh, at the end of each day for half an hour. Then I started getting a second bit of physio between the bike and the run, just for 10 minutes um, for the next couple of weeks. But at around day 30, I decided to 
cut, get rid of my physio, daily physio, in favor of sleep. And that was probably one of the best decisions I made, I reckon. Because in those early days when it was taking me 16 hours, 15 hours, I, uh, the physio was really cutting into valuable sleep time and I just wasn't recovering. So I made the core, which is a difficult one because I didn't know whether my body would be okay without physio. When the first couple of days it, it was, you know, things were tight, but I sort of managed to just use my elbow and thumbs and I got a massage gun and a foam roller. But then after that, my body sort of became adapted to it really. And if you've listened to Christian and Gustav, the two Ironman world champions, uh, they barely do any physio. They do no massage, they do nothing. They just sleep twice a day. For them, sleep's the most important thing. And I sort of learned from listening to them and reading up on what they do, uh, that yeah, the sleep is, is way more important. So now, yeah, my time started getting a bit better then. So I was just getting way more sleep. So that's how I've managed it. How has your sleep been? Are you getting quality sleep? And how long for? I'm sleeping well now. Yeah, I'm getting eight hours, eight hours a night and I have done for the last 30 odd days. But yeah, in the beginning I was getting five hours, four hours, five hours, got so slow. Um, and also I'd had hot sweats. I was sweating so much and my body was just under stress. I had a really high heart rate at the beginning. My sleeping heart rate was 89 overnight average. So it was you know, hitting hundreds at points. It's interesting you, you talked about the 10 pillars of endurance before because sleep must play a big part, but it's actually also fundamentally, it's all those are the nine things as well. And if they, if they fall out of balance, it's going to affect you in some... Yeah, exactly. You, you, if you want to do decent distance or a decent time, you really have to do pretty much all of them. All right, coming to the main road bit now. Okay. Um, One thing I learned from watching a, a clip with uh, Mark Beaumont uh, many years ago, he talks about there's a difference between pain and injury. And yeah, many yeah. people think that when their body's in pain, it's injury, but actually it's just tired muscles. And you can still work those tired muscles within a certain element. Is that some kind of mantra oh, yeah. that you're in balance with your body? Yeah, but you've got to have a lot of experience to know the difference, really. Which is why a lot of ultra-endurance athletes are older, because they have that experience. And, but sometimes you don't know, you know. So right now, I'm experiencing pain on the inside of my quad. It's called the something longus, Simon will know. <laughs> and uh, I know that that's just pain. However, if unmanaged, it could pull on the tendon up in my groin. And if that if that's tight for too long, I could get tendonitis. So, you know, you can't just be stubborn and go, oh, I'll just deal with the pain and suck it up. Because actually, if you want to play the long game, that might not be the best strategy at all. And it's all good to be brave and heroic and go through all this pain. But really, you know, five minutes with the massage gun could fix it. It seems like everything is, like I said, in, in a delicate balance. And to get to day 69 and still be looking and sounding so strong is remarkable. But I suppose there's always that risk day after day that something's going to slip in the wrong direction and cause things to be off balance. Yeah, it's annoying actually. Like if, you, if we'd done this podcast 10 days ago, <coughs> I would have been very confident in my, in the fact that I was beyond risk of injury now. I was <laughs> really conditioned. But actually, I'm now injured again. So you're right. It's, you know, it's still risk that something will go wrong. And at the moment, it's just this tightness that won't go away. So I don't know how I'm going to fix that, but I'm in the process of trying to manage it. How much leeway do you have on time every day for the 17 hour cutoff? Um, about three hours at the minute. So I'm way within the 17 hour. So there's always, I guess, that the knowledge that you can slow down the run, walk more often, if that's what helps get you through yeah. that day. Yeah, but walking's just as demanding on your body as running, if not more, because you're just all muscle. Whereas if you've got a good run, you're using 
your fascia and all that, which doesn't <coughs> tire or demand calories and things. So I guess there's that, find that, that little sweet spot yeah. between the run and the, and the walk, which... It's much harder walking a seven hour marathon than running a five and a half one. Much harder. Like, there's no way I, if you had to say, you know, if I got really injured and someone said, oh, well, that's okay, Sean, now you can walk for the rest of the, you know, for the next 30 days or whatever, I'd be devastated because it'd be so hard because it's hard on the muscles of the hips, the your, heart, your glutes, your ankles, because you heel strike mostly when you walk. So where could you find that allowance that might help you fix yourself in the next week or so? I don't think time is it. I think uh, I'll have some maybe at Lake in here. Okay. I have a banana though. Lovely, getting a banana. Can mark on this slide. Um, doing a slower day is not going to fix me. So I just have to f manage it in other ways. If anything, doing a slower day will make it worse because I'm spending more time on my legs. So the idea is to still try and keep a decent pace so that I can, sorry, I'm eating a banana. <laughs> Don't worry. If I can do a decent pace and get to the end quicker, I have more sleep time. And I think sleep, sleep and massage and stretching at the end of the day, I think is what I need. So that's the goal. Ready? So I have, I suppose, a little story to tell you, um, perhaps in closing this podcast. I'm a graduate of your 496 challenge. Oh, amazing. So I did it, actually did oh, it in nice. December of 2021. Brilliant. It was the same year, I think, when you started it in January. Yeah. I remember following that. Um, yeah. But at the time, I was, I was coming out of injury and I was in a bit of a sluggish time with my running. There's no chance I could have done that in that, in that month. Yeah. But I put it in my sights and I was like, well... You thought it was a great way to start the year. Yeah. And I was like, but December, we get so much holiday time. And once yeah. you get into like the 20s onwards, yeah. it's during like the holiday period. Oh, was that Christmas Day run? That must have been fun. Yeah, 25 <laughs> kilometers on Christmas Day. <laughs> but what was worse was having to get up the next day and do 26. On yeah, Boxing Day, yeah, I bet. <laughs> but it was nice because I had the time with family. Yeah. It was um, quite a quiet time of the year anyway at that, that Christmas. Christmas is not a big thing for me. Um, and so I made it work around what I kind of liked. I don't know if I could do it again. I just seemed to have a good year where I had that time and my yeah. family were there to support me, yeah, yeah. give me food when I needed it. And I had that mindset to go out and do it. Amazing, well, congrats, mate. I'm, pretty pr I'm really proud of how that's taken legs, the 496. I really thought I'd just be the only one who ever did it. And then, yeah, every year, a whole bunch of people do it. It's brilliant. So for, th for those who are listening who don't know what it is, the 496 challenge is running the date in kilometers. Yeah, on a month that has 31 days. So one kilometre on and the two, first. Yeah, and then two on the second, three on the third. And then eventually you're running 31k on the 31st. And if you add all that together, it's 496. Yeah, you, you finish the month with a 496 kilometre tally. But also, what's very interesting, which you might not have actually realised, you also have a 30-day run streak, officially. <laughs> because... Oh, yeah. To be, to be official, it just needs to be more than a mile. Oh, so so the, from the, day two. Yeah. yeah, from day two onwards. Oh, brilliant. So I finished <laughs> the 496 challenge. I didn't know about the official ruling at the time, so I had run a few days beforehand. So okay. on the after the 31st, when I completed my run, I had a run streak of 35. Ah. Oh, wow. And I, Pretty good. I realized that because I was doing such high mileage in that last week, I committed to myself to do a cool down week afterwards. Okay. So I ran, on the 1st of January, I ran 10 kilometers and then nine and then eight. Oh, all the way back down to about four. Okay. And then my body kind of settled back in again. Yeah. That first day was, a, was an absolute challenge. Okay. The 1st of January, mm. I was in all kinds of pain. Yeah. But I got it done. And then the next few days were helping my body kind of reset back to some kind of normality. Sounds like a sensible thing to do. I just quit cold turkey. <laughs> but crucially, I got to the end of that period and i was very close to a 50 day run streak amazing so of course i had to go uh -huh. and try and get the 50 oh right which i did Brilliant. and by the time i was at 50 i just felt good again like my body was back to normal so i carried on right. what comes after that the next milestone is 100, 100 yeah. three digits yeah i got to that no way. and i thought wow i never thought i would ever be someone who could run 100 days consecutively yeah. in a row you're impressive, mate. After that, 
I just carried on. Uh -huh. Didn't really have any motivation, but I thought, let's just see where this goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to a year. Did you? Wow. 365 days. This is now official because I didn't, yeah. in I include it from the 2nd of December. Yeah. And then currently I've now got to, I think I'm on like 558 or something. Wow, geez. But I've told myself I can stop now. Yeah. Because I've got nothing to prove. I don't want this yeah. to continue from onwards. The next big milestone is a thousand and that's like a year and a half away. That's yeah. way too much. Okay. But I haven't stopped yet. Yeah. What do you think I should do? Oh, you gotta keep doing it. It's not good. It's not a huge time commitment, I presume each day. I guarantee if you stop, you'll go a week and you'll be like, damn it, why did I stop? I've got to start again. Because you're never going to, you're never going to do it. Well, you might do it again, I guess. But while you've got the momentum, I would say uh, crack on, mate. <laughs> There's one thing in my diary next week, which is going to be a challenge. That's Glastonbury. Uh, I'm there for a whole week because I'm working well, there. Just put your Strava on walking from, from uh, just run from stage to your tent. That's you think that's going to count? A mile, a mile running? A mile walking? Well, it doesn't matter. Well, no, run it. Just run to the stage, run to the toilet, run everywhere. <laughs> you know what, actually, collectively over the whole day, maybe that is actually possible. Absolutely. You've inspired me. We'll yeah. see. Sort of. No, the only difficulty is if you decide to fly to Australia or something. Please. You might have to just run on the plane or something. <laughs> no, no Australian bookings yet. Okay. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see how things go. I thought I would stop maybe in the next week or so. Nah. Come on, a mile. If, you, if, if, it's, if it's a mile to tick the box, because you walk a mile in a day, just run it instead. But then how far do I go though? <laughs> I, I asked this, so one of the things that I've, I guess I've struggled with is mentally is getting yourself prepped, getting the running clothes on, getting out the door, knowing even if it's just a mile, yeah. that is always like beating in the back of my mind. Cool. And it's not a pleasant thing to have every single day. And the mentality of that has probably been the hardest part. Physically, it's easy. Like you yeah. said, it's just a mile. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd find that bit easy. I would just find what the record is. It must be in the thousands. There's guys been doing it for 50 odd years plus, I think. Yeah. All oh, right. Well, yeah. you're young enough. Why not? Crack on. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I told you this, obviously, because the 496 challenge is something that you inspired me to do. But I've, I've come here today and I've seen how strong you are, how positive your mindset is, how you've been able to chat with me quite easily. And I know that James Lawrence did 101. And so the obvious goal for you is 102. But how far could this be pushed? How far can someone go and do this? Um, I think with the right crew and the right support and the right location, you could... I think maybe you could do a year, you know, you'd have to have two locations, a winter one and a summer one, uh, somewhere in America, I think. You'd have to have a lot of luck, you know, injury, health, you know, and you'd also have to be the right person with family, <clears throat> with no young kids. I would s sort of say your kids probably should have left home, you know, because that would be unfair, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what I meant to say is, this is the hardest thing that anyone has ever done and yeah, it'll be difficult to break it. But I think once you get in your groove and you've got the right support team and you don't get injured, which again, 10 days, 10 days ago, I thought I'd dodged all the bullets, but you know, there's always that risk. I think someone will do 150 or 200 pretty soon. Not pretty soon, maybe in the next five, 10 years, five years. I'd like to help them. If anyone's out there who wants to have a crack at the, the 150 or 200, give me a shout. I'll help you out. But you've got to want it. You've got to really want it. Because if you, if you have any sort of like doubts whether you're up for it, you will just bail. You know, when that alarm goes off at 4.29 and you're not hungry for it, and you've got other things you could be doing and you, with, your, with your life that you feel is better. Yeah, you'll just, you'll just bail. How far do you think you can push it? Is there, is it in um, your mindset more than 102 at the moment or is it just getting there first? Uh, I don't really, I can't really go much past 102. I, I promised my family I'd be an, a dad again. I've got young kids. 
you know, I wanted to see if I could do 102. I sort of, in my mind, I knew I could, but it's always a challenge, of course. So if I get there, you know, it's still uncertain. Many things can go wrong still. If I do get there, then I've achieved what I want to achieve. I'm going right up here. Yeah, then, I mean, push going further. Yeah, just, that'd be unfair on Caroline and the kids. Already my son is sort of every day, he says, Daddy, Daddy, have you finished your challenge now so you can play with me? And my heart just sinks, you know, it's just, whoa, come on. So I just want to do what I said I was going to do. And then if anyone else wants to break my record, I'll happily help them. And if no one does, maybe in 20 years time when the kids have left school, <laughs> left home, then I'll, maybe I'll try for more then. But no, I think I'll be happy with the 102. But I, I think I could go further at the moment. I'm doing good times. So you could go further, you said? I think so, yeah. I feel confident and strong. If, for example, Caroline and her parents and they said, all right, well, actually, we're, we're going on holiday for three weeks without you, bye. And I was left here alone. I'd be like, oh, well, I might as well just carry on. It's manageable at the minute. It doesn't scare me doing another one or another 10 or another 20. It's just, there's, as in life with everything, it's not just simple. A simple case of like the physical and the mental. There's family and commitments and all of these things. And I'm a dad and a father and a husband, and I've got to do all those things. But definitely, I think in a in a different time, it's someone else in a different stage of their life that could take a year off to do something like this. I think we'll do more than 102 because I'll help them. <laughs> I've told them how to do it. Just, just email me. I've got. I've got. I think I've got the formula nailed. When you can write a book about the, it, the which ten, no doubt yeah. you will. Yeah, I will. And I'll, I'll sort of talk about this experience and the 10 pillars of endurance, you know, and uh, that uh, I think will be the, um, you know, a nice little book for someone who wants to go off and do long and difficult and miserable <laughs> challenges. Well, when this is complete, whichever number you reach and once you've had time to decompress, which I imagine will be a, a lengthy process as well, uh, I'd love to sit down with you and actually get the full recording of, of how it all went and, and what you learned in hindsight as well. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm really, I'm really keen to try and get more people to think about doing these just long, difficult journeys. I think they're really rewarding because I think too often now everyone wants the short, quick things, right? Yeah, well, if I can do this thing in seven days or in one day, and, but I like the long, long stuff. Um, I think it'd be good if I can hopefully get a few other people to have a crack at doing things that are long and difficult. That'd be very rewarding for me. Well, it's been incredible following you online. It's been great being here today, being present with you, mm -hmm. uh, seeing how it all operates, seeing how you operate and, and your mindset. <coughs> uh, I thank you so much for taking the time to, to actually scrape up a bit of your adventure on the road for a recording. No, mate, thanks, thanks for coming. It's always uh, nice to know that actually people are out there <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> following my silly little adventure. So yeah, well, next time we meet, I won't be stinking and covered in sweat. And I hope that cough is fixed. Yeah, I hope that cough is fixed as well. Sean, I wish you all the best in Thank the next you. few weeks. Thank you so much. Thanks, mate. Catch you later.